humanity definitely needs to um, pay attention. There's sort of an apocryphal quote that was attributed to Einstein about if all the bees are gone, then, well, all the humans die off. And Einstein never really said that, but about a third of the world's food, fiber, and beverage crops are either helped or created from that intimate pollination, that mutualistic dance between flowers and bees that has been going on for about 130 million years since the Cretaceous. So as dinosaurs, big sauropods would have been lumbering along, uh, there were bees visiting flowers during those times. So for the uh, about 1,400 agricultural crops grown around the world, um, at least 80% or so of them require pollination by not just honeybees, but native bees, um, flies, wasps, beetles, butterflies, and moths, and then some vertebrates too, you know, hummingbirds and nectar bats, that sort of thing. So we do need to pay attention. Welcome to Inside Ideas with me, Mark Buckley. We will be speaking to regenerative futurists, game changers, on systemic change and about desirable futures with those who want to see us on the right side of history. Brought to you by 1.5 Media, Innovators Magazine, and sponsored by the Alohas Regenerative Foundation. Stephen Buchmann is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas. Stephen is a pollination ecologist specializing in bees and an adjunct professor with the Department of Entomology and of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Arizona. A fellow of the Lillian Society of London, he has published over 150 peer-reviewed scientific papers and 11 books, including The Forgotten Pollinators with Gary Nabhan, also by Island Press, and most recently, The Reason for Flowers, Their History, Culture, Biology, and How They Change Our Lives by Scribner. Buchmann is a frequent guest on many public media venues, including NPR, All Things Considered, and Science Friday. Reviews of his books have appeared in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Time and Discover Magazine and other national publications. He is an engaging public speaker on the topics of flowers, pollinators, and the natural world. His many awards include the IBPA Benjamin Franklin Award and an NSTA Outstanding Science Trade Book. For many of us, the buzzing of a bee elicits panic. But the next time you hear that low sound, that low droning sound, look closer. The bee has navigated to this particular spot for a reason, using a fascinating set of tools. She may be using her sensitive olfactory organs, which provide a 3D scent map of her surroundings. She may be following visual landmarks or instructions relayed by a hive mate. She may be tracking electrostatic traces left on flowers by other bees. What a Bee Knows, the book that we will be discussing here today, exploring thoughts, memories, and personalities of bees invites us to follow bees' mysterious path and experience their alien world. Stephen, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here and to talk about my favorite subjects, you know, bees and flowers. I loved your book. I, I, I read it cover to cover. I, I normally would read it a few times, especially with such a fascinating topic. Uh, we were 
shortly press from the launch of your book, March 7th, worldwide, was when Island Press released it. And Julie Green uh, from Island Press was nice enough to uh, send over your information and uh, was immediately interested because on Inside Ideas and the Alohas Regenerative Foundation, we do a lot around agriculture, around farming, around uh, pollination and around the things that go on, uh, on in the world with insects and and uh, also those destructive things about um, chemicals and fertilizers and pesticides that kind of disrupt those beautiful um, workers who help us pollinate and help us uh, uh, in, in farming and ag and in our uh, in our world. Um, and so I wanted to read it because I, I wanted to really get to know more about bees and pollinators and, and that they have a language. As you open the book up, not only do you kind of say, we're talking, we're going to talk about something that could feel like, you know, this alien world or this alien species and how they view and see the world, but you tickle the fact that if we're not careful on how we read it, it could be a pornographic novel because there's some uh, quite a lot of talk about um, mating of bees and, and, and sex, pollination and, and the things that they do that is uh, how they see the world, how they interact and what their life consists of. Um, which really just immediately drew me in, not not because I'm a sex maniac or uh, around porno, but it was just really uh, fascinating that you know the majority of their um, their lives is reproduction, and and uh, another wonderful fact is that not all the bees are are honeybees, you know, that the, the majority are, are, are others. And so the book just on and on goes out through one discovery after the other of these aha, wow, inspiring moments that I thank you for, that I, that I hope we can not read the book for, for everybody or rehash the entire things, but tickle and tease it enough for those people who've heard us or heard the mention of bees and pollinators in the past, but wonder what's what's the buzz about? What's the what what is all this uh, science and, and uh, um, entomology about that? I have no clue that's going around on around me every day. And so, my my first question is, why this this fear factor around insects and bees and, and this initial like. We've got to get bug spray. We've got to get something to kill them, or we were going to get stung. Something that's going on. Why do we have that? Yeah, it's. I've wondered about that myself, and it definitely seems to be a uh, east-west cultural factor. So um, I, I'm actually heading on a short vacation at the end of the month to go to uh, Japan. And in Japan and China, there's great reverence in their art and culture for insects uh, and many myths and stories about them. But, and for example, in Japan or China, you might have people keeping crickets as little songsters, you know, in little bamboo cages in their homes. Where, uh, whereas in the United States, in Arizona, where I live, uh, the cricket on the hearth probably most likely elicits a shoe thrown at the little songster, you know, or like you said, reaching out for a can of Raid or insecticide, which we use to uh, not just poison them, but happily, uh, ignorantly poisoning ourselves as well. But the, the stinging factor, anytime something small and buzzing, making a buzzing noise flies past us, we, we instantly sort of jerk away. And um, yeah, at least in the West, there's this fear of, oh my God, there's a bee. It's, it's going to come after me. Uh, 
people say he's going to sting me. First of all, that's wrong. The boys don't sting. The uh, females are using a stinger that through their evolution is a modified ovipositor, but now it's this defensive weapon that has venom so we can be envenomated. But, you know, that bee that flies by your ear is not, you know, hell bent on stinging you. And one sting is not going to uh, kill you. The Only about 1% or perhaps less than 1% of the human population is actually allergic to, to bee venom. Um, I mean, that's not to make little of those people that need to carry around epinephrine in the form of a uh, prescription EpiPen or that sort of thing. But yeah, we just, we just have this, as, as I said, in the West, I think kind of an innate fear of uh, small insects and we want to stomp them or, or reach for a can of insecticide or maybe to have some peace of mind, I guess, if you will, by the, uh, some, some people have these electric bug zappers. Um, <laughs> I just kind of cringe when I go to a party and somebody's got one of these things and, you know, you hear these zap of a lot of fried insects and generally they're trying to get rid of mosquitoes, but mostly what's hitting those electric grids are moths or flies or other totally harmless insects. So uh, total. That's, it's crazy. Do, <laughs> do you think there's an aspect of it that has to do with just the buzz, the sound that they make, not necessarily that somehow that's like a, a larger siren or something that triggers humanity or at least the Western world? I mean, and I've seen it before. And really, when you do no nothing or, or go about your business, um, it's not like they're going to chase you down. You've kind of invaded their space. Yeah. I mean, even for the uh, so-called killer bees, the Africanized honeybees, which we've had in, in my state of Arizona for the last 20 or so years, um, if, if one of those Africanized bees is on a flower, she's just collecting nectar or pollen, and you can literally flick her off the flower with your finger and she's not going to come back and, you know, zap you between the eyes. Uh, the dangerous thing is to go near one of their colonies where you can experience uh, the guard bees and then they can be reacting to the CO2 in our breath, uh, dark colors, fast movement. So that's why um, beekeepers like to look like the Pillsbury Doughboy. So you, you need to be in white overalls and move slowly and carefully. So um, if the bees interpret you as a bear or something or a skunk that's trying to come in and steal their honey, they're going to act appropriately, which is to defend their food and their home. Yeah, and I, love, I also like how you talk about that in the book as well. That there's different roles for different bees in, in areas and like you say that the, the ones collect collecting the pollen or doing the pollinating uh, as well are different than the guard bees that are closer to the hive and so there's you know there's some different ways of looking at that world and for us um whether it's them who see our world as this alien species or we see them as this alien species it's interesting the more knowledge you get and, and that's what i got through through the book as well it's just on how they think and how they act and how they mate and yeah. and what the populations another big factor um that that was really interesting to me and and you know a big dummy as i am i i would say i i i didn't know that the the, the majority of the honeybees are actually not majority at all. They're kind of the smaller portion, and that um, uh, they're uh, and then the difference between social bees and and non-social bees that that are, are so the numbers I thought were totally backwards, but you know to find out that is so interesting how that works, and I'd love it if you to kind of explain that and and how that works and tell us a little bit more about that. Sure. Um, 
when I go around and give talks and I ask people to name various bees they know, uh, well, obviously the honeybee is number one. And then some of them will know the charismatic black and yellow bumblebees. And, and maybe if they're really enlightened, they might know carpenter bees or sweat bees, but that's, that's three or four, right? Out of, we have 21,000 described species of bees around the world. And, and the vast majority of them are ground nesting. And people look at me like I'm crazy. What? Bees are in the ground? Um, solitary bees that are non-social. I, I like to think of them as uh, single moms with a family to feed. Uh, after they've mated, uh, dad's gone, and the female has to go out and find an appropriate place of uh, bare soil that's close to the flowering plants that provide her food. And she digs a tunnel. And then at the end of the tunnel can be one up to a dozen or more brood cells. And she basically uh, provisions these with a mixture of pollen and nectar. And they, they usually make a little pea-sized ball of it and then lay an egg on it and basically seal the cell up. And then she may go on to make other cells within the nest. And she may make several nests during her lifetime. But she basically seals that up. And so for those solitary bee females, there's no contact between the, the mother and the, uh, the progeny, her, her larvae. So it's basically like, you, you put your baby in a room and put all the food and toys in there and basically locked the door and said, good luck, see you when you grow up. <laughs> so that, that's the lifestyle. And in the most cases, these solitary bees uh, remain underground for a whole year. So the males and females that mated to produce this next generation developing underground usually takes a year. So if you see them the spring, then they're gone. The only thing keeping the species going alive are those larvae and then pupae and then adults below ground. But generally, it's a one year, one year life cycle. And that's a, um, that's a, those are the solitary bees. Would you, you, I think in the book, you said it was over 80% of the bees are solitary. Is that correct? Or is it more than that? Um, it's, it's actually about, uh, mm, well, yeah, about 80%. And then we have a mix of about 10% that are social. And then there are some other bees that, that don't make an honest living at all. And they are kleptoparasites. They, uh, hang out near the entrances of nests that other honest, hardworking bees uh, make and they sneak in. And so it's as if to give a vertebrate example, it's like a, a cowbird um, that would sneak an egg into a host bird nest. And then the mother rears those foster chicks. And so these kleptoparasitic bees do that as well. Um, although the one, one genus that is kind of my favorite kleptoparasite genus has a, a strange name, Triapelus, and the adults look sort of like uh, zebras. They're black and white striped. But they're when they come out of the egg, their egg hatches before the host egg, and there are these long, skinny, evil-looking larvae that have big ice tong-like mandibles. And so their first job is to seek out the host egg and kill it and eat it. And then they'll go ahead and eat the provisions within that nest. So about 10% of the world's bees are like that. And, and the average person, in fact, the average entomologist would never even encounter or experience that kind of bee lifestyle at all. So around the world, there are just incredible, amazing life histories for bees that do different things. There are bees that we call the polyester bees, uh, and they don't wear little retro leisure suits. 
but they do turn chemicals called macrocyclic lactones into little wrappers that protect their developing larvae from pathogens and keep them from drying out. Um, I mentioned the kleptoparasitic bees. Uh, then we get into bees that are highly social. So you have like a bumblebee colony where a bumblebee queen could be mated in the fall and then she will go hang out in kind of a little hibernation chamber over the winter. But then in the spring, she will go and find an area for a nest and she'll produce a few tiny workers, which are her first brood. And then those gradually take over foraging for nectar and pollen outside the nest. And she stays at home just as basically an egg layer. Um, and so the bumblebees have an annual cycle where once the colony is really big in the fall, they produce males and virgin females that go out on mating flights. And then the colony pretty much crashes and dies. And then you have the uh, mated queens, which disperse into the field, and they'll often go use uh, abandoned mouse burrows or something, maybe with some grass or other insulation as their nest. Um, then you have the very familiar Western honeybee, Apis mellifera, which is known to most people around the world and is our uh, Jill, our heroine of pollination. And they're easily trucked around uh, different countries to pollinate agricultural crops. And, and those colonies are essentially uh, immortal. They're, they're perennial. Uh, you have bees foraging every day of the year, as long as weather permits, down to about 50 or 55 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, they're bringing in a huge, huge amount of nectar, processing it, ripening it into honey, getting rid of the water to get it down to about 20% water, 80% sugar storing it in those beautiful hexagonal capped combs, and then being able to use that as sort of fossil fuel, uh, fossil energy in the form of, of sugars that came from the nectar. And, and those, those colonies are quite, quite interesting. As I said, they can, the queen can live for two or three years. Uh, they can requeen themselves or a beekeeper can do it. Uh, I've, I've worked on feral honeybee colonies here in the Sonoran Desert of Arizona, where they're occupying rock cavities and below the colony uh, is this sort of black gunk that I've analyzed and it contains pollen and other things that are dropping out of the colony. So you can actually do a bit of forensic palynology and identify those pollen grains from these what I call debris middens from below the colony and know what they were eating. So for example, in Arizona, Africanized honeybees are eating slightly different things than the regular Western honeybee. So just, just amazing fun things that you can do by uh, sort of looking into bee pantries. And that's something I've done my whole career by trying to identify pollen grains and figure out, hey, what are the bees going to for food? In in the beginning of the book, you said you, you have been stung before. And, you know, that was one of the first things we tried to address is kind of the fear of being stung or the fear of insects and bees and and why we have that. Um, you're, you're still alive and kicking, doing well, thank right. goodness. Um, and it, you're probably not running around with an EpiPen, but this is your your choice of study to to do this and to teach and to to research this. Why why did you choose this, and and why has it become so important? And beyond your own personal passions and reasons for for diving into this, is there? a reason why humanity should take a little bit better notice of pollinators and of bees and, and of all the many species that, that we have in our world and maybe are losing? 
Yeah, definitely. Um, to get back to my personal aspect, I think by about the third grade, uh, when I was raising caterpillars and uh, chasing butterflies and doing all that sort of stuff, I was taking note of bees and other insects. And certainly by high school, I was keeping honeybee colonies and pretty much at that time, uh, as a junior in high school, actually started working with a local college professor who later became my mentor, my entree into the world of pollination and eventually did a master's degree with with him before I left to go to another university for my uh, doctoral research. Um, so I've been bitten by the bee bug for, for a long time, and I've never lost my passion or fascination for figuring out their hidden lives and their sensory modalities and all these cool behaviors that they do. And humanity definitely needs to uh, pay attention. There's sort of an apocryphal quote that was uh, attributed to Einstein about if all the bees are gone, then, well, all the humans die off. And he, Einstein never really said that, but about a third of the world's food, uh, and not just food, but food, fiber, and beverage crops uh, are either helped or created from that intimate pollination, that mutualistic dance between flowers and bees that has been going on for about 130 million years since the Cretaceous. So as dinosaurs, big sauropods would have been lumbering along, uh, there were bees visiting flowers during those times. So for the uh, about 1,400 agricultural crops grown around the world, um, at least 80% or so of them require pollination by not just honeybees, but native bees, um, flies, wasps, beetles, butterflies, and moths, and then some vertebrates too, you know, hummingbirds and nectar bats, that sort of thing. So we do need to pay attention. And I like to point out that it's not just pollination that is the ecosystem service that bees bring us, but I talked about those ground nesting bees. Those females tunneling in the ground are acting like earthworms. So that's what we call uh, as bioturbation. And that's bringing air and water into the soil. And then at the end of the life cycle for those larval bees, since they're eating all that nitrogen rich pollen, well, they poop it out. So the larval bee feces are acting as fertilizer uh, for those soils as well. So really some amazing things that that bees are doing. But you, you also you did talk mention... about vertebrates. I want to just before you move on too much uh, are about worms. Um, and it's really funny because that story you just tell is kind of a, a bee acting as a, an aerator, which is also kind of what what um, some of these earthworms do. But they earthworms also leave these castings behind, which are also great for soils as well. And so um i'm i'm positive a lot of people w are probably shocked or have never heard that this is a beer bees an aerator and it's also leaving these uh, form of castings and waste behind that's a, a fabulous fertilizer that kind of nourishes the wood wide web and and the soils that we have as as a positive for that as well as all the other pollination factors that come into that as well so um it, it, it's amazing the deeper that we go the more we uncover on on, on this this journey how these uh, aha moments these moments are like wow i didn't know that it just you know uh is so interesting yeah yeah the hidden lives of bees that most people don't have a clue about uh because we're <laughs> we're afraid of being stung or something um but of those, well, we have 
probably about 100 or 110 crops in the U.S., and I think I mentioned about 1,400 around the world. And we have been losing our pollinators. Um, research in Germany and Sweden have shown really drastic, uh, very frightening losses of bees, uh, surfid flies, other pollinators, uh, sometimes 20% losses or so over just several decades. And here in the United States, we have uh, about 50 species of those fuzzy black and yellow bumblebees, and about five of them are really in trouble. Um, the rusty-patched bumblebee, Bombus affinis, and then one that my late um, PhD advisor, Robin Thorpe from UC Davis, had worked on uh, Franklin's bumblebee, Bombus franklini, which of the 250 species of bumblebees around the world, most of them living in China, uh, that had the smallest range of any bumblebee. And um, in the 90s, Robin went out and looked for it and was seeing drastically uh, smaller and smaller populations every year until I think about the year 2006. Uh, he didn't see them anymore. So in that case, we think what's happening is what scientists have called uh, pathogen spillover. So to make a long story short, there were companies in Europe, in Israel, in Belgium, and a few other countries that were breeding bumblebees to pollinate crops like tomatoes uh, in greenhouses. And so they came to the United States and collected bumblebee queens in Florida and some other southeastern states and brought them back to Europe and bred them alongside the uh, one of the European bumblebees, Bombus terrestris, and they swapped pathogens. So these microbial pathogens got into the U.S. stocks of bumblebees, and when they brought them back, uh, they were using them in greenhouses to pollinate tomatoes and other crops. And those greenhouses are not bee-proof, right? All the louvers and things to adjust for temperature. Well, tomatoes have pollen, but they don't have nectar. And so they're feeding the bees with some artificial nectar in the colony, but the bees like to get outside and visit real flowers. So they were leaving little trails of these microbial pathogens on the flowers, which got transferred to our local bumblebees. So that really is why we have four or five species that are highly threatened and one that is presumably extinct in the U.S. And the same thing is happening around the world, maybe not due to pathogen spillover, but what we're doing to our landscapes in terms of converting natural ecosystems into uh, urban areas for housing and, and shopping malls and parking lots and all the stuff that we're doing that is destroying or altering habitat for bees. I mean, that the, the tie to food is probably the best opportune moment for me to ask you the next question. And I, and I told you we were going to talk about it and it's really not, your focus area or, or your specialty, but I know you you have some knowledge. You've heard about it. You've you've uh, been in that area um, probably once. Knew the numbers, and they're always changing. So we hear how the um, hives and bee honeybees are kind of going down in population. The pollinators are going down in population. But yet, even regardless of the China-United States issue that we had with uh, some honey issues, uh, I, I believe it was about 2018, there was a big time that there, there was a lot going on, and then 2019 as well, um, that we're, we were having more honey produced than there were actually colonies out there of, of, of beehives to collect honey from and I'm just uh, 
regardless of what numbers you pull out of the air, I just am not sure how that how that jives. And so there's got to be some form of, of man-made intervention or manipulation in that. But um, when you when you speak about how vital it is for agriculture for pollination to to help with our food crops and what we what we see see out of that and that these hives are moved around or or, or bred and and you know kind of crossed and then moved around so that we can keep the 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 food system going or keep keep things moving along that not a, not necessarily all our interventions are really good. But can you kind of give us a more insight in, into that world or what your thoughts or ideas are and how, how we've gotten to that point? And if you see it maybe improving or what we need to do to get to back to a stance to maybe support those hives, to, to get more hives, to, to produce honey naturally, to get more pollinators so that we're not, you know, running into... To the problems that we're running into sure yeah well the first thing you mentioned um has happened several times during the past decade or the past couple decades but uh around the world there have been some some bad actors whether they're in the us or europe or china and it's it's pretty easy to adulterate honey to sort of produce man-made instead of natural bee-made honey. And usually uh, what's happening is that people are take, buying uh, railroad car loads, literally tankers full of high fructose corn syrup, which tastes very sweet. And it's in tons of products and lot, especially a lot of processed foods. Not the healthiest thing for us, but it's cheap to buy and then you can either sell that as honey or you can cut honey and as you say you can end up having a lot more honey than the bees could ever have um, have produced that's that's really true um I, i'll just before we leave the honey subject i'll mention my my, my vote for the world's tastiest honey so i've done work with the indigenous Mayans in southern Mexico in the state of Quintana Roo, uh, south of Cancun and north of Belize. And they have a bee that they've tended for millennia, actually back three or 4,000 years. And it's called Shunan Cobb, and it's the sacred uh, lady bee or royal bee. And it's, it's not our Western honeybee, Apis mellifera, but it is among a group of like 400 species around the world of stingless bees. They have no stinger, uh, but that doesn't mean they're defenseless, but they do make an incredible, incredible honey uh, that is used not just for food, but it's used uh, medicinally. I know they use it in um, eye preparations to help prevent cataracts. And I think it's also used in childbirth, but it's an amazing, amazing, intensely floral honey. So whenever I'm in that area, I always try and uh, buy some from the Mayan beekeepers and attend their bee ceremonies because we can't legally get that uh, honey into the United States. Um, back to pollination, the thing I like to say is that, well, we have one of 11 species of true honeybees in the genus Apis, Apis mellifera. And it gets used around the world. Well, in China, they have another Apis, Apis serrana, which is used agriculturally. But we need to have a, just like the stock market, if you play the stock market, we need to have a balanced portfolio of pollinators, not just one. So many of my colleagues, um, Formerly, I worked for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and there's a lab in Logan, Utah, where they have developed uh, leafcutter bees, which actually were came from Eurasia originally, but now they're managed in Canada and the U.S. And I mentioned the bumblebees. So there are um, the leafcutter bees, there are 
bees called mason bees in the genus Osmia, which, for example, will pollinate, do a great job of pollinating sweet cherries and other tree fruit crops. Alfalfa leafcutter bees, which pollinate alfalfa, and the bumblebees. So fortunately, there are some scientists and some growers in the U.S. and in Europe who are developing these as alternative pollinators. So they put some redundancy back into Mother Nature. So if you look at almost any of the, whatever is the right number, uh, perhaps 350,000 species of flowering plants in the world, in very rare cases is that plant pollinated by just one kind of insect. I mean, yeah, maybe for a, uh, a fig wasp, or a yucca moth, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. But generally, there can be half a dozen or a dozen or more pollinators that visit that crop plant or wild plant. So fortunately, there is redundancy. Uh, worst, worst case scenario, if every honeybee on the planet were to drop dead right now, all these other players, all these other pollinators would step up to the plate and we wouldn't totally lose our crops. We'd have some lowering of the pollination efficiency and some lessened uh, crop yields, but we wouldn't totally lose our food supply. Well, that's good to know. And it's nice to, to know that, you know, I think they play a role that diversity to, of just not just one pollinator that we have that biodiversity in our practices and all over in the way we farm, the way we grow food, the way we make sure we have <clears throat> healthy soils. We also need to make sure we have a healthy insect population uh, that are right. uh, pollinating and doing their other jobs. There are some natural um, uh, pest reductions through certain insects and bugs and things that are, are, are kind of helpful and different types of weeds that can act as uh, good nutrients, uh, brown matter, and, and that for the soils as well. And I'll bring all sorts of good things. Dandelions for um, the grass and stuff are great for, for uh, bees. And uh, is it pollinators or just bees? But yeah, there's a lot of good things out there that are, are really vital to, to have that diversity. Um, we've left the topic of honey, but in, in the process of being able to discover, is it corn syrup, rice syrup? Is it some kind of a, a alterated honey out there? Um, the reason why it's not always uncovered is from what I understood, there's only like four or five really good uh, places to do the, the check to see is it 100% pure honey. And I know two uh, two very reputable places are in Germany, and I don't know... They also do a lot for the United States, but it's a lot of work and, and, and requirement to say, hey, is this pure 100% pure honey or has, there been, has it been mixed with something else? And I don't know exactly the, the tools they use, but the reason I bring, it, bring that up is that in your work with, the, with bees, you guys are doing uh, amazing experiments to see the size of their brain and to do these scans and, and, and uh, to, down to this microscopic detail on, on what bees are and, and all sorts of things as far as putting color dots on them and kind of trying to put plants upside down and tilt them to see how they can align and guide in. And I mean, it's, it's definitely alien sci-fi to me, the way, um, you know, the, you, you guys have worked and tunneled into that. So, I mean, just on the flip side is it's, it's just as hard to kind of adulterate and fake and to discover that fake, but the discovery of what you're finding out about a bee's brain and their behavior and, and, and all these things, there's a lot of science and technology and things that you guys are using that I read that was just amazing. Um, that there, at, at one point in the book, you you mentioned that there's like a, a micro, micro, is it a microscopic recording that you can do of 
of a bee to kind of see that whole film process that is normally hidden. It's, it's not seen. You can't see on the honeycomb structure um, that was kind of uh, uh, debated or controversial that they say, well, we can't always see that. There's not always a way to see on how that works. And there was a process there. He says, well, we can do it, but it's, it's not, not very normal. Um, can you tell us about that? Or do you, do you know that section that I'm talking about there? Yeah. Um, just do a really quick uh, comment about the adulterated honey. So there are labs in Germany and the U S that use pollen grains to tell if it is, let's say, orange blossom honey or tupelo honey or alfalfa or buckwheat honey, whatever you want. So they'll take the honey, they'll dilute it one to one with water and they'll spin it in a centrifuge, make a pellet to that. And then there's some other chemicals. Uh, it's a process called acetolysis. And then they'll examine that sediment under the microscope at, you know, 400 magnification or so. And, you know, if you see citrus pollen grains, there's a pretty good chance that, that, hey, yeah, that's orange blossom honey. If you don't see any pollen or you see the wrong kind of pollen, then it's, then it's mislabeled. Yeah. Um, but I, I lead from exploring this alien, wacky sensory world of how bees see and smell and taste and hear their world, which can be very, very different than ours, um, to experiments that colleagues of mine around the world have used to explore. I mean, you think of um, bees, let's take a honeybee brain, which is the most studied bee brain so far. Um, it's about the size of a poppy seed, and it has one million neurons, nerve cells, it might have up to a billion synaptic connections. So there's a lot packed in that little space. Uh, the brain is not, well, it is bilaterally symmetric, but they're not left and right hemispheres like ours, but there are giant optic lobes that process all of this visual information that come in from about 5,000 different omatidia, the little uh, eye facets. Uh, sensory cells in their compound eyes. And then the uh, B antennae, the feelers, that is where they're getting information on floral scents and other smells, along with uh, sensing water molecules in the air. So there are these places where the nerve endings wind up. And I, this is not my field, but there are beautiful photographs of tracings so that the nerves can be injected with fluorescent dyes. And then you can see, let's say, where in the eye to where in the brain these nerves are going. And we can figure out, kind of map the uh, neural connections of the brain. Uh, since, since I'm a uh, wild mushroom hunter, uh, there are things inside the bee brain, giant things that are called mushroom bodies that are kind of central processing areas for higher functions uh, and perhaps areas where uh, memories are consolidated. I mean, bees can remember things for hours or several days or perhaps in some cases throughout their entire lives. But yeah, I do make make various comparisons to our giant 80 to 100 billion uh, nerve cell human brains, but down to what that little tiny uh, poppy seed brain can do in the bee, which is really a lot. And we're just finding that out, oh, in the last, uh, I would say, 10 or 20 years. Uh, well, and even the last several years, um, my colleague, Lars Chitka, in London has done, he and his students have done amazing things with bee learning and figuring out uh, what bees are, are doing. That's amazing. And do, do you, um, see, I, there's, you know, last probably 
15 or more, 20 years, more Jane Bennis and, and her biomimicry, the Biomimicry Institute and things and how they look at everything from birds to, to sharks and, and things to kind of how to use biomimicry in the world. Do you ever see this complexity of, of, of a bee brain or their, their vision or how they see the world that we ever try to replicate that or use that in, in our current technology or is that, is that already going on? Um, I think a bit of that is going on. I guess I think more in terms of um, biomimicry in terms of the physical structures on the bees that are just, we're just barely looking at. So just like some plant seeds, you know, sort of were like Velcro millions of years before we thought of Velcro. There are hairs on the bee bodies that grab on to pollen grains just due to the physical structure or perhaps aided by electrostatic charges. Um, that's something that could be investigated. Um, bees are chemists par excellence. So for example, some bee larvae uh, their, their skins, their integument, have glands that end up coating them with kind of uh, an acrid secretion. It's almost a harsh phenolic smell. And as far as I know, these have not been identified, but it seems to me that these are natural products that the bee larvae are producing to combat soil-borne fungi and other pathogens. So these are things that are uh, in their chemical arsenal to keep them healthy and safe. And so we could perhaps do some bioprospecting for important chemicals from bees that could, uh, could help us in our human lives. In, in writing this book, and you've written numerous books, what what was the most important message that you wanted to deliver to the readers? I mean, at the end, you kind of talk about the things that you you couldn't fit into the book or into the chapter that you wanted to portray, and there there wasn't a good fit. But what what made you start out on this this journey? It was really to communicate um, that bees have a memory that they their their sex that they speak that they see the world different that they are extremely smart and uh have a <laughs> even though it's a, a a a small brain it's pretty amazing uh what was it specifically that led you to to go in this direction yeah a, a good question and a, a number of those reasons um i think for the most part i wanted to sort of jump outside of my comfort zone a little bit and get um, outside of the normal pollination research that I do, although I did want to make sure that I was up to date on the latest sensory findings. You know, for, for example, we've known for years that honeybees and other bees can see ultraviolet light that we can't see, so that even though we and bees share what is called a trichromatic vision so that humans see red, green, blue as primary colors. Bees see uh, green, blue, and ultraviolet as their colors. So unless we use a special filter over a camera lens, we don't really see what they do, but we can, through technology, see um, as if we had bee vision. Um, but I, I, I really wanted to dive into some breaking news sort of about bees and things that are definitely a little more controversial. For example, some of these topics, um, pain. Uh, I'm still amazed that probably at least half of the scientists that I talk to don't believe that bees feel pain. And I think this is a little bit... Um, uh, wrong-headed, basically. Uh, we know that bees have nociceptors, nociception, so this means that they can move away from uh, noxious stimuli. Also, just personal observations. If I have 
a bee in my lab or outside, and let's say I catch the bee in a net and then pinch its leg with a forceps, it turns around and tries to sting me and produces an alarm buzz. Well, to me, that hasn't proved that the bee can absolutely feel pain as far as we do, but certainly indicates that it's in some discomfort. It doesn't like it and let me go. So um, those topics, I mean, I, I brought in um, work of Barrett Klein on sleep. Uh, we know that bees sleep for six to 10 hours per day. Uh, they go into these rigid sleep postures uh, early in the sleep phase, they're actually moving the the antennae, the feelers rhythmically, and later there's no movement. But you might even think of that um, rhythmic antennal movement almost as uh, rapid eye movement, right? REM sleep. Uh, so we don't actually know all of the things that are happening when bees sleep. In fact, we don't actually know most of what people are doing and when we're sleeping, but we think that memories are consolidated during the sleep and they need to have it just like we need to have sleep and, and suffer when we're sleep deprived. Um, other topics, you know, I talk about, I suppose the, 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 the strangest one to get at is, sentience. Um, there are many different definitions of sentience. The Self simplest one, yeah, the simplest one would just be awareness of, of pain. Uh, but then you would get into, you know, other emotions. And I don't, my, my colleague, Lars Chitka in England, who wrote an excellent book last year, The Mind of a Bee, uh, thinks that bees may have certain, uh, emotions and I'm, I'm i'm not sure that i'm willing to go quite that far uh don't know that we'll we'll ever really know um but um there there let, let, let me bring up one other thing so i i do think that bees have a primitive form of consciousness i do think that they feel pain uh i do think that they have some level of sentience and they're self-aware. I'll give an example of one experiment that was done with bumblebees. So insects don't grow as adults. Once you've eaten all that food as a larva, when you come out as an adult, that's your size. You don't grow as an adult. But basically bumblebees come in small, medium, and large size as the workers because of eating different amounts of food during their larval development. So you can have skinny, normal, and fat bees. Well, bees were trained to fly through a slit to get to a food reward on the other side. And the fat bees knew they were fat, so they had to turn sort of sideways and move their legs in a different position to get through that opening to get to the food. So to me, that experiment uh, is not difficult to understand. The bees knew their size. <laughs> so they, they had a level of, of self-awareness. Um, That's amazing. Another, That's so yeah. cool. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the other, my, my favorite experiments are the type that are done by other colleagues, Peter Kevin at Guelph University in Canada, or Lars Chitka. And these folks have trained bees to find hidden rewards and to use sort of a tool to extract them. So for example, they took little circular plastic discs and drilled shallow holes in them and then put sugar water in there because the bees are sugar junkies. They want the sugar reward. And they attached a tool, a string to that. But everything was hidden under a plexiglass shield so they could see it and they were trained that okay, that's where the food is. But to get it, they had to bite and tug and tug and tug and pull at that string to pull that whole little sugar sled out from under the cover. And there are great videos on YouTube that you can go 
to see this. Um, to go even as amazing as that is, they took little um, groups of bees in a cage that were held nearby so they could see what the trained bees had figured out to get the reward. But they had no experience with the tool or the apparatus. But when the bees that had just watched the trained bees work that system were released, they instantly went and pulled the string so and got the reward. And this is something that we call social learning so that they were learning something something simply by watching other bees that knew what to do figure it out <laughs> that's just that's absolutely amazing there there's a couple of things i want to touch upon and i i don't know if you've seen them so they're obviously in the you're in the united states and arizona there's been this big uh controversy uh lately around TikTok, actually ever since it came out, them in China. Um, but there's been some fabulous things around bees on, on this TikTok. Not only um, people grow, uh, kind of being, the, being their own beekeepers and keeping hives and, and making their own honey, but then going out and rescuing um, hives that have kind of gotten trapped under a barn or hidden somewhere and so the you know weird places that they're going to get them out clear to what i assume and i hope i'm assuming right are um these these beekeepers i think and one of them is even one of the mayan beekeepers that you talked about your favorite honey where they're in these huge what seemed to me like these huge amazon trees way up just big old uh, you know uh, like the redwood forest, huge trees um, where they have these really wild bee cones of, of honeys just sticking out there and they're climbing up this amazing tree and then hacking it off and the bees are, you know, seem pretty big in that, but it's just, it's just incredible to see this. Um, not only because it's, there's this interesting, it's like watching National Geographic, the Nature Channel, but on TikTok, but that there's this huge awareness rising of people like that there's a diversity of bees and movement and people saying that I, I'd never seen that before. I thought bees was a honeybee and it was, you know, that was it. And we've obviously talked about that. What are you seeing in, in the movement? Are you seeing a lot of positive movements in that direction? Have you heard or seen anything? And what what are the trends that you're seeing moving forward in and um, new awareness of these environmentalists, the climate activists that are moving in the future, those who are talking about let's let's uh, make homes for the bees, let's do things positive in that direction. What what are you seeing, and how do you feel about that? Yeah, well, first I'll go back very briefly to the uh, I'm not a TikTok user, so I haven't seen that, <laughs> but I I, I have made uh, eight trips to Peninsular Malaysia and worked with a gentleman, um, an indigenous Malay a grandfather, Pakte, in the Kadah region of uh, Malaysia, right up against the uh, border with Thailand. And I wrote a uh, children's book with uh, my co-author, Diana Cohn, from Sausalito, California. And uh, it's called The Bee Tree. And we detail how in this case, a grandfather and uh, two teenagers related to him would climb these trees 240 feet tall, you know, 60 meter tall tropical rainforest trees, the tallest ones in Asia, to basically be honey robbers, to take the honey on these giant parabolic combs that can be one to two meters across. Um, and these bees are are ferocious, you know. They they are the world's largest honeybee, and you don't want them coming down to sting you because it's not a pleasant situation. But they they take uh, torches up into the tree, and they bang the torches, and it creates this cascade of sparks that go fall to the ground. And bees are often said to be um, red blind 
where their vision is shifted into the UV and away from the red, unlike ours. But somehow they're seeing infrared wavelengths because they can see these uh, incandescent sparks. And basically it, it moves all of the bees off the comb and then they're pretty much unprotected. So they can cut off the comb and then send it down in leather pails. And in the meantime, they're chanting to Hittim Manas, which was this legend from thousands of years ago in the Rig Veda. Uh, just fascinating, fascinating stuff that we talk about in this children's book, illustrated children's book, uh, The Bee Tree. But through through all of is this, is the honey at least worth it? Is uh, it the honey? Is it the honey very is good? good? Okay, <laughs> I have tried it, but I, you know, I've climbed up the primitive ladders on the side of the the trees up about twenty feet to pose for photos, you know, selfies. But that was it. I'm not going up to the branches that are way way up there. <laughs> But I imagine it's pretty, I bet, I mean, that's a, you talk about adventures climbing Everest. That's like the, the, the Everest of uh, honey, honey uh, adventures. I don't know. It sounds pretty amazing. So the hope, the honey tastes really good. Right. <laughs> the, uh, but yeah. We... With that, there's one, there's one more thing I wanted to kind of say with that, that tie. And then I want you to finish that uh, story. Um, in this whole movement, there's also been a lot of uh, a couple of startups. One is the Flow Hive around honey that they've created this new hive that they just kind of flip a switch and it it's supposed to be better for. Is that the case? Are are these new uh, type of hives that are coming out to make it easier for people or to easier to get honey and to kind of be a beekeeper yourself without? you know, a, a lot of the, the thing, a, a lot of the, the knowledge, the, the bee suits and all the other things around it. Is that a smart decision? Is that a good positive direction to see us going in? And how do you feel about that? Yeah, I, I think it's a, a good idea. I've seen the advertisements for the Flow Hive. I've wanted to buy one and try it out myself. I haven't done that. But certainly anything that gets... um hobbyists into appreciating and keeping bees who knows my hope is that if they get turned on by honeybees then they'll want to find out about leafcutter bees and mason bees and orchid bees and even vulture bees <laughs> all these other crazy bees out there ground nesting bees um you know you can be a beekeeper and you can be very gentle and not kill bees i know there are people who are devout vegans who don't want to uh, eat honey because um, they they believe that the bees are, are killed or somehow tortured to get the honey. And I mean, it, it is possible to take honey from a honeybee colony without harming any bees. But when it's done on a commercial scale, there are bees that are, are killed just because they're doing it so so fast and processing so many hives. Um, you mentioned, I, I think earlier we talked about moving bees around. I, I did my doctoral research at UC Davis near Sacramento in the Central Valley of California, and that's home to about 800,000 acres of almonds, and most of the world's almond nut crop is grown there. So they bring in a million colonies to pollinate those almonds. And because the colonies are crowded and uh, there's sort of zero tolerance for weedy flowering plants because they need to have the uh, ground below the almond trees either on plastic or bare earth. So they literally shake the trees to fly the nuts off and then vacuum them up. Um, the bees can experience a lot of problems with um, diseases and then pesticides. And then when those colonies are moved around, the beeswax acts like a, a sick building syndrome. So all those agrochemicals get caught up in the wax. And then it's like, you know, that new car smell, 
not so great for you because like formaldehyde and other things are outgassing. Well, that honeybee colony is, is outgassing as well. Um, yeah, so just just touching on some of these things. I'm So I am a fan of hobbyist honeybee beekeeping or people putting up drilled boards or straws to invite safe and sane leafcutter and mason bees in that won't sting at all. They don't produce any honey, but now you have pollinator pets that you and your family can derive a lot of enjoyment from watching them bringing in cut leaves or different color pollen, that sort of thing. Um, what, what I am uh, a little upset about is that in some cases, for example, in the United States, the uh, U U.S. Forest Service has been allowing commercial beekeepers to come into national lands and to put hundreds or thousands of honeybee colonies in one spot. And since those honeybees are super organisms and so good at doing the waggle dance and the scouts go out and find food and then they can take down the standing crop of nectar and pollen to the detriment of native ground nesting bees or other pollinators, you can have too much of a good thing. So you can saturate an area with honeybees that really isn't good for the ecosystem and, and other pollinators. So uh, I say, let's be mindful of stocking rates for honeybees, just like people are mindful about stocking rates for cattle on various lands. Um, so that's, that's one thing I wanted to, to mention. That's fabulous advice. And I appreciate those are, these are all great little insights that kind of not only raise our awareness that as you go throughout your book, and I recommend it highly that everybody reads it. And what, we're only tickling and teasing it a little bit. We're not really uh, reading it for everyone, but it there is so much to learn and to get out of it. I personally have adult children, and I remember when my kids were younger, um, my youngest daughter, she really wanted always to be an entomologist. Matter of fact, I just bought her the book uh, from E.L. Wilson, Edra Wilson, the naturalist. And, yeah, and that's a great the, book. It's a great book. And, and um, he just passed away. I mean, sadly, but um, I, I always have had this respect, but I always also had the thought and, and you, you touch about it and you, you, you talk about it in the book and, and you touch about do bees feel, do, do pollinators feel? Does there, you know, are they are self-aware things like that? But in entomology, there's a lot of, you know, you, insects and bugs and bees kind of dissected and put up on these beautiful pictures and then sold and and you know put a pin prick in and, and and things and labeled and kind of put on display and and that and I, I understand for science or for knowledge and, and things like that. Um, and, and it's a, I, I'm sure that's much different than chemicals, pesticides, raid, bug spray, you know, kind of just a, on this war path to get rid of, uh, of bees and insects because you just don't know or you think they're bugging you. Um, how do you feel about that entomology process where you see, uh, the, I, I know just in my region here, there's probably 15 different stores that just sell bees and insects and butterflies and, and, and these things. And, and is that a good thing? Is that a good thing to raise awareness? And I mean, that's why I asked you the question, uh, before about the TikTok and the raising of the awareness and kind of the trends that we're seeing on, on these things. When Disney came out with the, the the movie Finding Nemo, there was all of a sudden a problem in our uh, in our oceans with with the the fish of Nemo, you know, the little oh, the little clownfish. Uh, yeah, yeah, the little clownfish, and and it really created a whole market space, especially in the Asian things, and and, and you know we want to be wary of that, but we also want to be wary if it's if how do we keep that in a positive movement and also 
be aware, not only are they aware, but how can we be aware that we're kind of cautious moving in, in that direction? That's kind of where I'm going with my question. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, throughout my career, I mean, I started studying bees at probably about age 15 or so, and I, I just turned 70, so I've been studying bees a long time. Um, you know, as a, as a card-carrying entomologist, I have collected and killed thousands of bees during my career, mostly earlier in my career, and those wound up labeled and on pins and in various museums in the United States. And those specimens are very valuable in terms of we can get historical DNA from them or figure out what plants uh, the bees were visiting. So those historical specimens are used now by scientists studying global warming and climate change. Um, so I don't regret that, and I think it was necessary, but in terms of where I've been in the last 10 years or so of my studies, I will still collect a very limited number of vouchers that get stored in a museum, and I'll, <clears throat> excuse me, let your listeners know that it's because of the fact that we've got those 21,000 species of bees out there, and most of them look alike. So unfortunately, unless you have either a dead insect on a pin or a captive bee that you can look at under a microscope and compare with other museum specimens, uh, or some scientists are now using DNA barcoding uh, to identify their specimens. And, and to publish papers, you can't really say, you know, it was the quarter inch long green bee from Tucson, you know, you have to say it was uh, Agachlora Aga pomoniella to be able to have your research have any validity. So this is really different from somebody who's a birder who can go out with binoculars and a field guide and identify all of the birds by sight or sound. Um, and people get good at that, and it's possible. Also, there are guidebooks for butterflies, and it's possible to identify the vast majority of butterflies. There's a big um, group, NABA, in the United States, the North American Butterfly Association, that advocates watching butterflies through close-focusing binoculars. Uh, and now there are even some guides coming out on odonates, you know, dragonflies. So, so I, I do think that, well, certainly my my views have changed so that now 99% of the time I observe and capture bees through my camera lens and, you know, take photographs of them. Um, I don't like the idea of massive amounts of butterflies or other insects being simply processed as wall art or displays or being embedded in resin as jewelry and that sort of thing. I, you know, I don't think that's necessarily the right, right thing to do. Um, although certainly insects have, insect collections have inspired many cool kid to go on and, and become a naturalist or a trained professional biologist. But there are certainly um, companies that are going into areas in the wild and collecting beetles and butterflies at a uh, unsustainable rate. Um, and then even though some may be farmed, we still have the ethical thing of, well, hey, they're sentient, they can feel pain. You know, what are we, what are we doing to them? So we do need to I think reconsider our interactions and relationships with insects uh, from an insect welfare standpoint. And this gets really, really complicated because I know even colleagues of mine are considering, um, you know, what is the best way to raise insects as human food? I mean, around the world, insects are eaten in great quantities by different 
cultures. But uh, again, what are the ethics of raising them by the by the millions? And then how do you, you know, if you're going to use them as a food product, how do you euthanize them? You know, and, and have that be a uh, uh, I don't know quite what to say, but a, a caring, thoughtful way of doing it, just as we would consider if we're uh, a meat eater, how how do you go about treating uh, food animals with, with respect? As, as we kind of close up, you, you are <clears throat> currently working on some pretty interesting things around um, ground nesting bees that are oil harvesting bees. I'd love to hear a little bit about that, kind of what you're doing currently, some things you're optimistic and, and hopeful on, even though you've been doing this your whole life. It's almost like uh, it, it's it's never going to, the discovery is never going to stop. I, I just, and I think that's a fabulous. I mean, what a better world to dive into. Um, when, one thing I never mentioned, but when you started out the the book as well, there's the talk of how um, a bee was preserved in amber. One of this, uh, one of these things that you know, and you says we, we at the end, but that we've got some pretty because of, luckily because of that some pretty old records of how long bees have been around and been here way before us and, and doing amazing things. So uh, now keep going full circle. There's still new things you're discovering that are interesting. Yeah, that bee in amber is fascinating. People have been looking for the world's oldest bee in uh, Cretaceous amber from uh, Myanmar, what was formerly Burma. And uh, I've we, we have a uh, Tucson Gem and Mineral show, one of the biggest fossil shows in the world every February in Tucson. So I'm always going to the uh, amber dealers and with my hand lens looking and to see that I can maybe find a new bee or a, an old bee. Um, but yeah, just in the last few days, um, right now the Sonoran Desert where I live is just ablaze with yellow flowering trees, uh, the genus Parkinsonia, which the locals know as Palo Verde. So they're smooth bark trees that have green bark and now they're just exploding in yellow blossoms and uh, we have many native bees that go to those and one of my favorites is this oil collecting bee which goes to a different plant it's actually a parasitic flowering plant that needs to derive nutrition through its roots being connected to other plants it's called cramaria or ratony but it, it smells exactly like raspberries. And so you go out near these plants and go, wow, where, who's got the raspberries? They smell great. And these bees, female bees, have little oil scrapers on their front legs. And they'll go to these flowers and they do this little four-legged, unless you, you videotape them on high speed like I've done, you don't see the motion and appreciate what's happening. But they're using their legs to scrape the oil out of these glands. They pack it on the hind legs and they take it home. And home is a little nest about that deep underground. And the females uh, of this bee, Centrus coccarelli, will carve out these little amphora shaped cells and polish them smooth. And then they'll go collect nectar and pollen from those yellow flowered Palo Verde trees bring it back. And the very, very last thing they do is go to those uh, cremaria blossoms and bring back this raspberry scented oil. And they put a thick layer of oil on the top of the pollen, and then they'll lay an egg on it and they'll seal it up and they'll go and do it again. And what um, chemist friends of mine are thinking now, we're working on a paper together, uh, Robert Raguso at Cornell, and Dan Pappage here at the University of Arizona. We think that the bee larvae are becoming imprinted on this raspberry smell. 
And so that a year from now, when they emerge as adults next year, they're already thinking raspberry. It's in their little bee brains, and they'll, they'll go out and follow their antennae, their noses, and find the, find the goodies, find those chromaria plants. So that, that's one thing that's occupying my days right now in the that's really beautiful, interesting. beautiful spring of the Sonoran Desert. Yeah, be beautiful area, beautiful things and time of the year. And then also, what a microbial, beautiful, beautiful story. You know, the small alien world of things that, that are going on is so beautiful to hear. There's other parts in the book as well where you you did experience, experiments and you also, or, or others did experiments where you kind of, observed some of the some of the bees were never trained on how to um mate or were to go for certain things it was just like it was there it was already built in they didn't need to first watch or mimic or be trained or 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 see something done to do it they just it was a, i don't know if you call it instinctively they just did it and and, um, you know, it's, it's amazing how many things ha have gone in that direction. I have um, three last questions for you as, as we wrap up. And this first one is the absolute hardest one that I'll give you today um, because it ties to, to, to your book and to your work, your life's work, um, but it also kind of doesn't. And it is, it is, it is the burning question, the big, big question. What does a world that works for everyone look like for you? And does an insect or epi entomologist and someone who cares about bees and about insects and pollinators? look at the world different with that that small lens of the small brain of a of a bee yeah um i was fortunate enough to know the late great ed wilson and to be with him on several field trips in panama and arizona and he was quite quite the entomologist and uh far more than that. He had this saying that he wrote about in some of his books that the insects were the little things that run the world. And they truly are. Um, insects can get along just fine without us, but we really can't get along without them. Uh, not just pollination, or about a third of the food that we eat globally, the things that keep us healthy and happy. I mean, we could have a whole diet of the cereal crops, right? The rice, wheat, barley, sorghum, that's wind pollinated and, you know, no bees need apply. Uh, but that would be pretty boring just to eat, to eat rice and corn all day. And, um, so bees provide us with the fun things to eat and things that have a lot of nutraceuticals. So you think of the colorful fruits and vegetables, uh, blueberries, cranberries, things that provide us with dense nutrients and antioxidants. So we, we need to live a kinder, gentler life with bees and other insects on this small blue orb. Um, there's a place for all of us, but we need to <laughs> we need to make sure that 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 there's a place for all the other animals and plants because they are our life support system, and without them, we're in deep trouble. I mean, we've already passed some tipping points, some milestones uh, according to climate change with the more than four hundred parts per million of c o two in the atmosphere as well as you know, over a degree centigrade temperature rises. So um, we, we need to be aware, even if nothing else, for our own selfish interests, 
Uh, I mean, even without considering that bees and insects and other organisms have a definite right to exist and live out their lives in peace and harmony, even if it's just a horrible self-centered thing <laughs> that like we want to continue and we want to be uh, healthy and happy. We need to, uh, we need to make room for, for all those little things that run the world. I love that. What should the youth of our world, the young innovators, the young new entomologists emerging, or the even the curious youngsters who are out there interested in the butterflies and the bees and the wasps and the bugs and the spiders, um, and especially related into your field, be thinking about if they're looking for ways to really make a real impact or to fix the legacies us elders have left them in this world to kind of make their imprint or have the biggest impact. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, because the, the young people of our world are the future, our future hope for our species and what happens to our fragile planet i would hope that uh, students would get interested in uh, not just entomology but biology and botany and um, get out get get away from the screens less screen time <laughs> and get out and experience and be inspired by nature um, watch things listen maybe use some of those close focusing binoculars maybe even if you're a little afraid of you have a little bit of entomophobia right you can still watch them from a safe distance and appreciate all these incredible behaviors and beautiful shapes and colors um you know people are doing amazing things uh one one thing i'm doing a little bit is scanning things with structured white light or lasers and i know a lot of young people are interested in this i'm going to grab a prop and see if it works sure, so this go ahead. this weird looking thing wow. is an exact replica of a sex pheromone gland getting back to the bee's sex in the carpenter bees and so this is something that i've studied and published on and so this this is a gland that in certain carpenter bees and the males occupies about a fourth or even a third of their thorax so during their evolutionary history they've forfeited space for the powerful flight muscles and put this sex pheromone gland in here so the every day i was just doing this last week I have a log nest of some of these bees and every day between 4.30 and 6, well, no, between 4.30 and 5.30, the bees leave their natal log nest and they fly out to nearby hilltops. And just like certain birds that birders may know, like uh, sage grouse, um, there are birds where the males display in lex, L-E-K-S, to females. So the females have a chance to uh, check out these males as potential mates. And within this gland, they're producing a blend of chemicals that smells like roses. And so they'll go out into these areas, hover and release this rose be aftershave, basically. And the females will come in and, and select a mate. So 3D printing right? Wow. Um, is kind of cool. I also think that um, students that are interested in a kinder, gentler footprint for insecticides, you know, we need to get away from insecticides. Um, I'll give one, one example. I'm working with a group of scientists on the brood cell microbiome, so the the helpful essential bacteria and fungi that live in adult bee guts and are also living in the 
pollen and nectar and mixture in those underground cells. And just like we need healthy bacteria, mutualist beneficial bacteria in our guts to keep ourselves healthy and happy, uh, the bees need that too. One, one thing our group just, just recently discovered is that um, people have been talking about herbicides for a long time. Well, herbicides kill plants. From a bee perspective, they're also killing weeds, but some of these weeds are flowering weeds like dandelions and things. You mentioned dandelions earlier, and these are helpful to uh, nurture and feed bees. But what we've just found out is that even though you can test chemical herbicides on adult bees and they basically have little or no effect, the herbicides get into the pollen and nectar and into that brood food provision underground, and it's killing off the helpful microbes. So basically, the herbicides are having an unseen effect on the larvae, the baby bees, that we didn't uh, didn't know before. Um, other things that I think could be really fascinating are for students and new researchers to get into like that biomimicry stuff that we talked about, or perhaps bioprospecting, looking at the chemical ecology of bees to figure out, hey, the bees have been around for 130 million years. They're really smart. They're chemists par excellence. And let's find out what chemicals they're using in their daily life that might be able to help us. I love that. Thank you so much for those words of wisdom. And the last one is really, in your life, what have you experienced or learned in this professional journey of yours so far that you would have loved to know from the start? And you say, wow, I wish I would have known that a lot sooner. Most people tend to say, the journey in and of itself was amazing and, and I'm still learning. It's still not done. Um, and I personally say, oh, I wish I would have known this decades ago because I would have started sooner or I would have done much. I would have acted different. I would have began the journey sooner with that knowledge. Uh, there are things like in your book that I just didn't know. It wasn't taught in school. And I wish I would have loved to, to know that before. So I would like to know in, in your, what have you experienced or learned in your professional journey that you would have loved to know from the start? Yeah. Well, certainly the, as you said, the journey itself has been an incredible reward and has taken me to many different countries around the world and to experience the flowers and bees in those regions. Um, but for me, I, I'm kind of a, a high-tech guy, so I like to use technology. So for me, I've always been into optical microscopes and electron microscopes and that sort of thing. Uh, in the 90s, I worked with a company and we produced the world's smallest barcodes. And we actually glued those little tiny barcodes between the wings on honeybees. And so then we had an automatic punch the time clock sort of thing as the honeybees went in and out of their glass walled observation hive. We knew, hey, B-54, where are you? Uh, wow. Now uh, we have, th there were issues with that because we could only label up to 99 bees. And if they were twisted, you know, we got a, a false reading or no reading at all but there are systems right now and actually i i have one and it's a uh, rfid a radio frequency id tag system so now we can take these little tiny tags and glue them onto the back of a bee and it goes through a little tunnel under a reader and then you know when the bee left to the nearest second and when she came back, and so we can build up little dossiers basically from birth to death on a bee and know how many times she was out foraging per day, uh, yeah, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. 
Uh, those are cool things. My my, and, and then you know we we can look at at bees with infrared cameras and get their temperature. You can even get little tiny cameras that will plug into your iPhone and let you look at plants and animals in the infrared, which we can't see. So again, these are techno things that allow us to extend our senses. Um, I'm a photographer, so I like to photograph insects and flowers. Well, now, instead of being frustrated that only part of your tiny insect or flower is in focus, we have things like programs like Helicon Focus and others where you can do multifocal uh, stacking uh, photographs, and you can maybe take a a hundred photographs of an insect's head or something, and then in these programs, put them together so it's absolutely all in focus. And these are beautiful. And these uh, appear now in books, and coffee table books, and are inspiring people to appreciate the hidden beauty of insects because they're too small, you know? So they're they're outside of our realm of sensibility so that we need these photographic or other techno devices to be able to appreciate their small but vitally important lives. I guess I'll end with, for this thing, um, my, my fantasy gadget would be a little bee backpack that I can put on a bee and I release the bee and in real time on my laptop, I'm seeing in three dimensions exactly where she's going. So we don't have that yet, mainly because we can't make the battery small enough, but hey, maybe some clever person will figure out that, oh, hey, if I put a piezoelectric crystal on the bee and as the wings are vibrating and flapping, it deforms the crystal, ah, makes electricity. So maybe we can someday, uh, hopefully in my lifetime, have one of these little bee backpacks so we can really figure out where the bees are going and what they're doing. <laughs> that's That would be amazing. Boy, that's a, so beautiful to hear and, and the passion and, and how you bring this beautiful life of, of bees um, to, to all of us. And thank you for bringing it to me. Thank you for letting us all inside of your ideas, Stephen. It's been a sheer pleasure. Uh, your book, What a Bee Knows, Exploring the Thoughts, Memories, and Personalities of Bees. Stephen Buchman, thank you so much for your time. And I really appreciate having you on the podcast. And that's all I have, unless you would like to add anything else before I tell you goodbye. No, well, I think that's it. Let's all give bees a chance. I agree. Let's give bees a chance. Thank you so much, Stephen. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now.